Good morning, up and ready to go. Last day of the course. New auditorium, a few glitches with the projector, but we managed to solve that. So it's a great pleasure to introduce the first speaker of this morning, Stefan van Dalen from IBM. And he will give an overview on the security architecture for hybrid cloud. Good morning, everyone. If I'm too loud, just raise your hand. If I'm too faint, do the same. Um, some words about no publicity here. You can buy the book, no obligations. <laughs> it's not because you enter the room, you have to sign. But it's a, a book I've written together with two colleagues of IBM, Mark and Karsten. And the reason we wrote this book is because we are three consultants working with large organizations. We had a lot of conversations. And inside IBM, we're using methods, security methods, other architectural methods. And there was a, definitely a need for explaining what is a security architecture and how do you do it? And so we started writing this book uh, more than a year ago. Hopefully in September it uh, will be available. But when I'm using these slides, most of it is, comes out of this book. Eh? So it's, uh, but I'll share some practical uh, experience. And so um, I'm Stefan van Dalen. I'm a uh, CTO in IBM now uh, for what's called NCE, Northern Central Eastern Europe. I don't know, 35, 36 countries. It's a collection of countries. And I'm part of as, as a consultant in security services. So you will find me at organizations helping them doing security. And I'm doing that is for the last 24 years. And so I'm doing security services for 24 years. Uh, and currently, it's publicly announced I'm, I'm a lead architect at the NATO. Eh? So I'm helping NATO with the, one of their security projects. Can't say much about the project itself. It's NATO. <laughs> but it's an interesting environment to doing IT security. Eh? They have their older particulars, and especially they get uh, adversaries you don't want to have. Um, let's see, today I got only three topics. We got one hour. You can ask anytime any questions. You can interrupt me when you want. Um, this is nothing to do with crypto. I'll, I'm not a crypto guy. I'm an end user of security solutions. Let me start with that. I'm not developing new things. I'm getting commercial off the shelf solutions, whoever the vendor is IBM, Microsoft, Palo Alto, Fortinet, name them, all the security vendors. This is my input my, and the constraints. Eh? So I, I use all the capabilities of those solutions and all the problems they bring along. Eh? So it's, uh, we are, uh, as security architects, we have an, a customer demanding solutions and to help them to secure them. And I have to use what's available. That's one of my frustrations day to day because some things work great, some things work half of what they should do. And um, let me start to explain what is security architecture and what is a security architect. Eh? And, um, and so this is security architecture. It's a simplified model, but I'll take time to explain it. So the most time the person I'm talking to is the CISO or the team of the CISO. The CISO is chief information security officer. The guy that, or the girl that gets fired when it goes wrong. Eh? That's the CISO. I think the average duration of a CISO in the US company was, was it one year and eight months or something like that. Eh? It has improved, but someone in a large organization is the responsible person for doing security. There's a lot of inputs. I, and again, you can Google on mind maps on CISO. There is a much more complex and nice one. This one, I just simplified it. So typically, you're working as a CISO in a company in within an industry, retail, telco, uh, financial services, military, whatever. So there are standards specific to the industry. There are, of course, a lot of regulations. Eh? You need to comply with the relations of the country, of Europe, uh, other regulations as possible. You've got, of course, all the threats, because that's special on security. It's not only that you have to deliver functionality and capabilities, there are also adversaries trying to get hold of your money, the data, uh, whatever they're going after. And then you got the business, because every organization delivers something, products, services, that's the business, that's what brings the money into the organization. So the business also comes with needs. Eh? 
And last but not least, what the CISA doesn't have mostly is a budget. Eh? So um, <laughs> there's a constant fight when I talk to CISOs. It's like, how do they get more money from the board? They go to the board of the organization. They say like, oh, there are all these threats. I need more money. And the board say like, okay, why? And why should they give you so much money? And so on. So that's the input. And on the output, you see like a CISO and a team has to do governance. They have to do risk management, compliance to the relations. They are undergoing audits all the time. Financial services, every month another audit from another internal, external audits. A lot of people asking a lot of questions. You need to keep the users educated, so they should not click on that you, you have won an iPhone email. Eh? They still do it, but you, so there is a continuous education of new threats. And, um, and let's be honest, it's getting very sophisticated. Eh? The AI is not helping there, let's say. They are helping the adversaries to making very good phishing techniques. You get called by a voice that sounds like your manager asking you to do things. Uh, that's, so you have to improve your education continuously. Then you have security operations. You do it yourself. You have a service provider do it for you. But someone needs to look after the security uh, status of your organization. And if something happens, you need a response team. Um, that might be, in a large organization, a dedicated team. If you're a small organization, that's maybe the same person who is the CISO between brackets. Eh? So that might be one person with 10 different heads on. And so anyhow, you need someone to respond in case of an incident. You have an engineering team. I'll come back to it later. The engineering team are the persons keeping the or implementing security solutions. And then the CISO, if he's lucky or unlucky, depends on how you look after it, has to sit in boards and committees, getting his money, explaining why it works, why it doesn't work. Now, where, where comes security architecture in the place? It's at three places. And the first one is enterprise security architecture. That's my favorite topic. But it's often not done because a lot of organizations don't have an enterprise architecture team, and some organizations have no security architect in the enterprise architect team if they have an enterprise architect team. So it varies. It doesn't always have to do with the size of organization. It's more like how a CISO office gets organized and if they are in the CISO office. Uh, because the enterprise architecture team is typically not in a CISO office. Eh? They are to the CIO. And sometimes the CISO is outside of the IT on purpose. Some organizations want the CISO team into this IT department. All goods and bets about that. Don't, I don't want to go there, but it's so there is an enterprise security architecture team. What does the team do? Set standards. Is saying like, how in our organization we're going to do security? Are we using which products are we going to use? What are the patterns? Uh, let's say they say that we um, will encrypt all hard disks of the laptops. That is a decision you can take at enterprise level, and then you have to do a technology choice. What's happening here? Sorry for that. It seems that even in presentation mode it goes dark. Um, and so the enterprise architecture team, that's the persons defining principles, patterns, and guidelines. The engineering team are the people who also doing security architecture, but they implement security solutions. Some people think that's security architecture. I've got an identity management solution, I got a PKI of a key management solution, I've got a security monitoring solution, that's security architecture. Well, that's solution architecture for security. Yeah? Solution architecture is you build a solution and the solution can be by coincidence or no coincidence a security topic. So then you have this type of things. So you got identity management, network security, application security, um, data protection, Infrastructure firewalls are still working organizations that think with firewalls everything is solved. Eh? That's, that's still the perception that lives. I've got my firewall, so I'm safe. Eh? And that's just one layer in, in your security approach, as we all know. That team should create or provide shared security services. You don't want every application in your organization using different authentication methods. Well, you could do that. It's probably not the most cost-efficient way to do it. So they provide an authentication service. And then we come to the topic of today, solution architecture. There is in your organization, let's assume you're a, you're a retailer, 
you get like an, um, a web portal for your suppliers. So that's a new project. You say like, hey, we're going to use this technology. We'll host it in a cloud. We're going to set a portal and they can provide, for example, if you're, um, uh, it's about food, uh, they have to publish all those uh, mandatory, uh, how it's called again, uh, nutrients and all those things. So the, port, the vendors can update the information about their products, the food products. So that's the project. You have to set up a portal. That's a solution architecture. Ideally, in that team, there is a dedicated person taking care of the security of that setup from begin to the end. Realistically, there is someone of the architect team that takes care of security, and worst case, nobody cares. And then, uh, uh, but most of the time, they should get. I'm always drawing ideal cases on PowerPoint. I can do that. Eh? That's not reality, but that's how I always say like it should be. They get from Patterns, design principles, guidelines, how you should do security when you build a new solution. And from the engineering team, they should get out of the box services. That's, and so these are three activities. All three are called security architecture, but there are totally different teams in a large organization. In a small organization, it can be the same person. What I'm going to talk today is about how doing security in a general solution architecture. Okay, that's security architecture. And um, I'm, I'm teaching a course inside IBM on security architecture three days. It has first four days, we had to do it, reduce it, so now it's a three days course. And those people are, um, have to mandatory do an architecture training first, also three days. And so, and even after six days, I would not call those people security architects, but they have at least an architecture training, because an architecture is an IBM a profession, like you can be a consultant, a, a project manager, and a, a specialist, and a SRE, eh? we got different professions. Um, and so after three days of architecture, you can then follow the security architecture training, another three days. Externally, I give a security architecture about eight hours, I get one day, and the complaint I get at the end of the day is like, oh, it's so much information, it's too much on one day. I said, yes, <laughs> but yeah, I can only give you one day. But it's, it's a, I just want to say like, it's a very broad topic. It sounds to a lot of people abstract. If you're not have worked in a large team, for example, on my projects, I need to count them quickly. I've got eight architects, yeah? Building a solution and I got two security architects in my team. And then I've got a team after that that's building and implementing a solution. That's another 20 people. So it's, it's like an, an architecture is a method and an approach how you build something from requirements till something that runs. And in cloud, you can say like, I can go to cloud, I click on the portal, get a virtual machine, I install uh, immediately some software, it's working, that's true, but is it secure? Um, and can you, um, can you prove if the evidence, if you get an audit, that you took all the measures you needed? Compliance, I've got a directive that has 340 controls. 340 controls I need to comply with. So I need to be able to show that whatever I deploy in that environment, it's compliant with each of those 340 controls. And that's how you say, then if you talk about requirement traceability, we call it. Eh? I've got requirements, so I got 340 controls, I build a solution, it's running on an infrastructure, and then I have to show to my auditors that coming on, say like, yes, let's take control number one, here's my evidence that I've implemented it. So that's what the security architecture does, but there are three types. Enterprise, I say for the whole organization how we're going to do it. Security, I'm doing security solutions, the, the fun stuff, and then the one that we keeps us busy is how we get any solution that's getting built and uh, that runs somewhere, how do we get it secure? What is security architect? And there is a hidden message from my manager, I, that's why this slide is there. Um, so there are two, and I'm, I'm not going to explain what is a uh, security architect, you can read about ENISA in Europe has a cybersecurity skills framework. And that's something I typically give to my customers, say like, what, what, is, what, are, what does a security architect do? What are the skills? 
will say you can download from Enisa a profile. And does it mean, yeah, it's not readable, uh, sorry for that, but it, so this is the knowledge, the skills they have. Um, it's a person with a T-shape, we call it in IBM, so a horizontal knowledge about IT in general, understand the business, and a vertical being security. Eh? There's a nice uh, website, but it's US only, it's cyberseek.org. Cyberseek.org helps people to find security professionals. And so you can say like, oh, I started as a security engineer, I became a threat analyst, I want to become a consultant. So it shows like what could be a career path and how you move from one role to the other role. And also the nice thing is a very dynamic site. You can click on it to see like how many uh, vacancies are there in the United States and which state for this type of profile. Eh? What are the typical requirements in the, if you go to the vacancies that say like, okay, an architect, and that's what I took the screenshot like, there are apparently 4,682 openings in the United States for security architects yesterday evening. Yeah? Um, so, so maybe I should move, I don't know, but it's uh, especially look, when I look at the left side, there, there is a discrepancy with Europe, I would say. But they say like the top skills requested, uh, sorry Christian, Google is not there, I saw AWS and uh, Microsoft Azure. <laughs> but it's, uh, and then you say, but the interesting thing is you can click on it, it gives a long list of things. Eh? So it's, uh, this, this is a lot of uh, information you can use when you have to hire or you think like, I want to become a security architect. I just tell you that it's a, a base. What's not shown here, which I find interesting is, 50% of my job is communication. That's 50% of my time. So 50% of my top is, job is technical. I need to know something about security. My other time is communication. And communication in two ways. I got people requiring things, management, customers, and I got people that I need to explain how to do security. Yeah? So I would say 50, sometimes it's even 100% of my time is communication. And there's a nice book from Gregor Hope. Uh, he works now with AWS, the software architect elevator. And I like the, uh, the metaphor of the elevator. It says like an architect has to ride the elevator of the organization. So he has to go to the penthouse on the top where all the board members are, he needs to explain how it, why it works or why it doesn't work. That's an architect who must be able to communicate to board level in non-technical terms what has to be done or what should be done. But he has to go in the ground floor or in the basements where the engineers are to say like which bolt have to turn on. So that, and a good architect can communicate in all the layers of an organization because every layer, you got middle management, you got line management, you got Scrum masters, uh, you get the, um, whoever your counter project manager, whatever your counterpart is, an architect has to do a lot of communication. And the vehicle that we use to communicate most of the times are diagrams. We love diagrams. We can discuss hours about the color of a rectangle if the arrow has to be one direction or two directions. Eh? People, I see two people laughing by no coincidence architects, <laughs> but it's, they went through this experience as well. Eh? So you can, because you have to show something, what the solution, solution looks like, and the diagram is what you use to communicate. Yeah? Because you need to explain to some people which are totally non-technical, what's the problem, how we're going to solve it. Yeah? You, what I learned over the years in hard time way is also, you cannot enter a room only with a problem. You enter a room with a problem statement and a solution. Yeah? If you only walk in a management room with a problem, they will send you back, you don't, that they can't solve your problem. <laughs> you can mention what the problem is, we have a security problem, um, but you have immediately to bring the solution. And then they will ask, and what does it cost? Eh? And why does it cost so much? And why we don't have it? Why did we know this two, two months back? And so on. That's the kind of communication you have to do all the time. So forget not about all those technical skills, very important, but you have to be able to communicate and you have to understand the requirements. Sorry for that. Um, you have to understand the requirements you get from your stakeholder. Uh, your stakeholders, because the, at the end, it's, it's about that. Eh? We're doing not because of the art of the diagrams, creations. We do it because we want to build something that works for our clients. 
Then a word about the method. And from here, I'm using only diagrams from the, from the book. Uh, you can use it as long as you mention the book. That's fine. It's, uh, we make them available on, on a uh, website as well. So I don't want to make things complicated today. I will show a more complicated diagram about the method. But the method is a way to do uh, an approach to the standardized way that uh, predicts you get a quality, full, quality outcome of what you're doing. And so methods is like we learned from our faults in the past, we made mistakes, and we learned that if you do it this way, there is a higher chance it will work. And so a method is built over experience, say like step one, getting requirements, step two, doing analyze and so on. So a method is not more than, well not more, it's important, but it's it's a standardized way to build a solution and it helps you to get what we call predictable outcomes. And you can repeat it over and over time and you improve, improve the method. A method is never done. Right? It's not like I've invented the golden method, I can use it to the end of the time. No, it's something that you continuously have to adopt. Eh? Um, and there is sometimes the questions like, what is, what is now engineering? What is architecture? Um, and we try to explain the book like, and what's design? Eh? Uh, I use someone who uh, worked for IBM as well, Grady Boots. says, architecture is design, but not all design is architecture. If someone creates a very nice diagram with a lot of colors and thinks about uh, the colors, that's design, but not per se architecture. Architecture is, a, again, we call it in IBM article thinking, and that's our training. You can find it back. Sometimes we give it, we deliver it even to organizations. If they ask, we can explain how Arctic thinks. But we train the people to uh, know or to learn how to do Arctic thinking. What is needed to get from requirements to something that works. And security, that's the second training, which like the fun part because a security architect can have different roles. Eh? Sometimes. I'm in threat modeling exercise, yeah? so that you can break the system. That's the fun thing, of course, because a security architect is not only like, it has to work, it has to be secure. You can also walk in as the outsider, say like, hey, you build a great solution, let me break it. Let's find everything that's wrong on your design from a security point of view. That's also a security architect or a consultant that's doing architect thinking, but like, how can I break the solution? Eh? That's uh, something, and that's on paper. Eh? <laughs> nothing, nothing, no one gets hurt normally in those kind of exercises. Eh? It's not like I'm hack doing ethical hacking or pen testing. No, I look at diagrams. I understand like what's the data flow, where it comes from, where it goes through, what kind of technology are you using, and then we try to understand like what's the weaknesses. Eh? Because also in a design there can be a weakness or a vulnerabilities. It's, uh, uh, that's an, uh, the worst vulnerability you can have is in your design, because if you fix that when it's already running, that might have to do, you have to go to the back to the drawing table. And so, um, uh, architecture is sometimes called an art, eh? real architects making buildings, they think about how the facade looks like, eh? they have to think like, it has to be nice in IT, in architects, some things we don't have to be nice. That's something who someone is doing uh, user experience design. They get endless discussion how the size of the button has to look like and the color of the rectangle and so on. And so that's not typically for an IT architect or a security architect, but it's more like it's uh, not a scientific way. There's, there's no, um, it's not like engineering. Eh? Engineering, I'm an engineer from education. Engineering is science. Eh? Architecture is a little bit more than just science. There is, you can do a lot of things to make it uh, scientif, and that's what we try to do is we try with the method to make it more science than just gut feeling based type of decisions. And so architect thinking comes with first a common language because that's a, that's a challenge. Eh? If I talk about an operation model, it, a term used in IBM, and my counterpart doesn't know what an operation model is, it doesn't help. So I need to explain like what, what, is, what, is, an, what is that. And also if I talk about like a node or a system, a network, you can't believe how many terms do exist for network. Eh? So if I say it's a network, what do I mean? Do I mean a subnet? Do I mean like something connected to a cable? Is it a Wi-Fi? The, all those things you need to have. You need like a common language, a taxonomy, a dictionary, whatever it's called. You have like practices, 
it's like an, it's not a list of activities. It's like you have examples, templates, patterns, and you have to use practices. Uh, practices are typically runs around teams, identity and access management, network, and so on. Um, and also, what happens sometimes still is security is, is done in a corner by a small team. No, that doesn't work. Security is part of the team. Eh? It's, um, you see that in DevOps a lot. You got this what he called security champions, a developer who has the head of the security champion should keep the whole development team honest, the DevOps team honest about their security. When you do peer reviews of code, that's the persons looking after the security. And architecture is about not about design, again, it's about the end-to-end -end from requirements to uh, operations, not just designing one aspect. And, and when we start writing this book, it's like there are a lot of teams. Eh? The, we all seem the passing by. We try to make it all together. Eh? Again, compliance is, uh, is the one you start with. Compliance is not security. Eh? You can be 100% compliant with a control framework and your data still can be on the street. Eh? So compliance is just there is a regulation. That regulation puts your criteria and controls and you've shown that you adhere to that. That is a foundation, a start, but it doesn't say something not about risk. It's improving with DORA, we can, I don't want to go there, but there are better, and the, the regulators try to adapt to the reality as well, uh, if you look from years back and now, uh, but what you have to add on top of a uh, compliance to control frameworks is you have to add risk, because at the end you're mitigating risks. What is the risk? That a ransomware attack happens to your organization. What if that happens to your organization? How can you respond to a ransomware attack? What's, uh, how do you, how do you uh, uh, evaluate the possible risk for your organization, the impact, and how do you mitigate? So what are the security controls you can do to reduce? You can never get rid of risk. That doesn't exist. Zero risk doesn't exist. There is always risk in doing things. Um, but you can reduce it and you can manage it. Eh? Um, the worst thing from a risk management point of view is you don't know what you have. And that sounds strange, but large organizations having a lot of workloads in cloud, uh, taking secure software as a service services, sometimes have gaps. They don't know what they have. They've got a responsibility, a CISO team has a responsibility, or the CISO has a responsibility of the IT, and the IT or the operation technology also. That might be a very broad term. And sometimes it's still lacking to have 100% good view what is under their responsibility. What are these? Who bought these services from this company on the cloud and that uh, our organization is using? Well, we don't know. We call it shadow IT. Eh? It's still there. Anyone with a credit card can buy services from a service provider. So the only thing you need is a credit card and internet connection. And so the, um, if you don't know what you have, you don't know what you need to protect, and you don't know what's happening. Eh? The, um, you got something like attack service management scanning. So you try it from the outside, identify where is my organization. It gives interesting results. Eh? If you have this service, you ask that for your organization, you think like you know everything that is under your control. Uh, we did some tests with, with some clients. If you do this external attack, try to find what else, where are you exposed to the internet, what kind, so that always gives surprises. People are surprised to say like, hey, I didn't know we had this portal, whatever it is, that's exposed to the internet and that is under our responsibility. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is data-centric security. How long are we telling about data-centric security? <laughs> as long I think we're doing security, but it's important, but it's, it's hard to do. Eh? Don't, are people old enough to know Jericho? Yeah, I guess, uh, Jericho Forum. Jericho Forum was something, I don't know, 2006, uh, 20 years ago, and they said something like, security should be, well, they said more than, but security should be close to the data. Yeah, borderless security, it started with that, and but also like, data moves, the security controls moves with it. That was the idea. So if I get like the, uh, I'm working for a car manufacturing, I designed the new car, um, whatever brand it is, and that should be stay secret as long as it's not delivered, eh, because there are people always interested in car design, so I need to protect that. But if I move that design from one system to another system, the, from R&D to production, how do I protect that? Eh? Because the data moves, but how do I get security controls moving with it? It's 
I'm not saying impossible, there are solutions, but it's hard. Data-centric security is about that. The other thing is zero trust, my favorite topic. I'll come back on it later. It, says an, it is overhyped. Uh, maybe I should blame Kulti as well, but the, the problem is what with the zero trust, it's the principles are great, security vendors overhyped it a little bit and people got like fed up. Oh, you're, you're back with zero trust. But uh, let me have one word on it later. And the last thing is secure by design. And that's also nothing new. The orange uh, books are about that. Uh, the um, common criteria is about that as well. Eh? Secure by design. If you build something, how do you make it secure by design? Less, less hopefully, less issues when I start using it. Okay. So this is a more complicated diagram about architecture. Um, no worries, I'm not going to talk of every rectangle. I could, <laughs> if we had some more time. But this is what, what this security architect looks like. There is a, on the top, there is a context. That's a given. Nothing you can do about it. It's this organization. These are the regulations. This is it. The top layer is your context. Nothing you have impact on as a, as a solution design team. There's nothing you can do about it. That's a given. You have to live with it. If you can't live with it, you're in the wrong place. So that's the given. And then you get requirements. That's something you should get. You can influence requirements, but anyhow, you need to understand like what are them building. And then you have the architecture block in the middle. That's how I will build. All the steps I need come like, I need to understand what, what we will build, uh, the different layers from a logical conceptual model to an, a detailed design. And then we have to say how we're going to run this. Eh? Because before DevOps, in the good old uh, waterfall times, we built a solution, we throw it over the wall, and then operations, they got it in their head, catch it, and then they have to install it and run it. Eh? That's, uh, now with DevOps, we got different ways to do this, but um, still you need to define in your design already how we're going to run this. And a security architect is everywhere in the... It's so like, where is security architecture? Well, it's not explicitly mentioned. There are some specific things like threat modeling and threat detection that are security-specific artifacts. But security architecture comes into place in every step. It's end-to-end um, -end, uh, because in the training I'm giving, I'm, I'm explaining like when in a an, in an solution architecture uh, or a sol project, when the security architect gets in, it's always too late. Eh? Sometimes I get like the design is done and say, oh, you need to secure it. Here's the design, fix it. Eh? I said, well, I might have to change your design from a security point of view. So a security architecture starts with the requirement analysis, doing the architecture and the operations. There are two supporting uh, elements in an architecture. That's the assurance. Assurance, what I said, is like the traceability. You need to understand like... What are the needs, but also what are the threats, eh, because we are mitigating risks, and how do we um, test against that? And the left side is uh, Arctic decisions. I'll come back on Arctic decisions, because that's the, um, the most important of all the artifacts. We can argue about a lot of which are important, but the most important is Arctic decisions. Especially we, in reality, you don't have much time. You get a sprint of six weeks. You have a, a deadline. So most of the time, those people don't create a lot of documents, but at least one document should be there is the architect decision. What kind of decision did you took to come to this solution? So that's what I said. So you get context, you get requirements, architecture, you design for operations, and you get the governance and the assurance to have a uh, methodological approach. So now, why are we doing security architecture? That's something, and this is the answer. Why are we doing this? Because that's the reality. This is a very old diagram. People knowing mass. This is coming from Method for Arctic and Secure Solutions. And so the, um, it's, that's how we have to think as an architect. Eh? So there are users or applications that can be also a user. There are assets, data, applications. Um, and they have a value for my organization. It can be my online banking solution that I use day to day from my mobile phone to do financial transactions. So the asset is clear, that's the money on my account, that's important. So I'm the actor, I like to get money from my employer, 
um, but also, of course, they need to pay and so on. So there is a lot of things happening. And then from a security point of view, we think like, okay, there is a functional aspect of it, so, but there is like the risks, and I said risks are driven by threats and also by vulnerabilities, because adversaries are abusing vulnerabilities. Whatever the vulnerabilities, a design vulnerability, a software vulnerability, whatever they can use. The human part, eh, social engineering, goes after the human being vulnerable for social engineering in techs. Eh? So it's, um, there is an, a lot of things you have to take care of. And so why do we need security architecture? Because a security architect needs to be aware that this is the reality. Yeah? It's not like functionally, because um, if you've got a product owner, he has this in the sprints, a product owner on the backlog, you look at the backlog of a product owner, functionality. The solution is to do this, this, and this, and we need, we got three weeks left. And at the end of the backlog, of the end of the sprint, I look at the backlog, what's there, all the security <laughs> activities. For some reason, I don't know why, this seems to get hard to get off the backlog. Eh? So that's, uh, there seems to be something with security implementation in sprints, uh, they have always a lower priority. So what we typically try to do then is like, we create a separate backlog, and we say like, okay, let's leave a security backlog, and you don't go in live if you don't have ticked off all those uh, 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 user stories from your backlog. So that's the reality, and that's one reason why you do it security. There are other reasons like, it's about coping with these threats, and that's why encryption, of course, comes in all the time, but it's, it's protecting data at rest uh, when it's in transit, but also when it's processed. Eh? If you heard about probably confidential computing, it protects even data while it's processed, eh? because in a normal context, you protect data when it's transmitted, you protect the data when it's stored, eh? but there might be ways, there are famous um, uh, malwares that do memory scraping and get the uh, passwords from the memory. Eh? So that's, uh, so you need to find also ways to protect data when it's processed. That's another reason why security architects thinks like, okay, what could go wrong? Um, I'm not doing here threat modeling, I'm just saying like a very simple system, but where do I need to think about security? In cloud, it's the same but different. Eh? There's nothing new in cloud. It's all the same things. But in a cloud, there isn't so much things you can use and that th those things, so we typically have the dark gray ones is what I say, the typical things so you got the CISO office, they have maybe, um, hopefully, a security architect that sits in the board, uh, the architect decision board. Um, they got a platform team, they're sitting on the cloud, and you got the cloud center of excellence, or whatever the name would be. Eh? They got different uh, uh, names for the same the team that sits up the cloud environment. They, Italy, they have allow the DevOps teams to take whatever resources from the cloud, a virtual machine, an, H, an HSM, a vault, um, um, a serverless function, a Lambda function, whatever they need to build their solution. But from a security point of view, is you want to have like pre-configured, you want to set the constraints, eh? you want to say like, you don't go to the marketplace of your cloud provider, select the resource, deploy it, done. Eh? Uh, even if you do it automated way. So you have to say, how can I protect, or how do I ensure that what they use in the cloud uh, that it's configured in a way that it's secure. Eh? The guardrails, we talk about guardrails in cloud. And so it's, it's, uh, this is a very simple example. Eh? I don't have too much time <laughs> to go in details, but it's like there's a, the DevOps team building an application. Eh? They got the CISD pipeline, they're building the application. In parallel, what you need to think about how to secure this, eh? because we're gonna write code, you can do source code scanning, you deploy code, you can do, um, dynamic application security tests on that code, uh, but also like they're using resources, virtual machines, containers, uh, serverless functions, whatever. You need to say like, okay, how can I harden them? How can I do a secure configuration? How do we validate that they follow those hardening rules? And then I can publish it and those, what they have developed should be using those infrastructure pipe. So you got an infrastructure pipeline, you got an application pipeline. You got multiple of these. Eh? So we got like 10 DevOps teams. You, Italy, you have one infrastructure pipeline, but reality shows that you might have multiple. Eh, but per DevOps teams, they get an application pipeline. Eh? And then once it's before deployment, you have your quality gates. 
Hier, all those things you can add security quality gates. I can test security, too much vulnerabilities, back to the drawing table. Um, I do a pen test, dynamic pen, uh, dynamic application security tests when it's deployed, too many vulnerabilities, back. Eh? So the quality gates are there to ensure what gets deployed in an automated way is to a certain security standard. So for me, cloud doesn't change much. The, um, when I saw it, let's say, the rise is maybe a big word, but let's say in 2018, 19, and 20, when the cloud really becomes common, eh, a lot of security offices were struggling eh, because the, the automation was something they didn't have. I give a simple example. Um, I got a web application firewall. Behind the web application firewall are two applications, portal one, portal two, two different DevOps teams. And so um, you have to deploy the policies on a web application firewall to protect your web application. Now, who can change the policies? Whoever has the permissions on the web application firewall. Do you want to give that to developers? No, because the first thing you do is turn off the policies because their application then works. Eh? That's the reality. I've seen it in banks. Uh, they say like, oh, my application doesn't work anymore. Should I fix my code? No, I can change the policy of the web application firewall. So I disable this SQL injection. Uh, and then suddenly my application works again, job done. Reality, I'm not joking, that's how it goes. Eh? So you should not give the permission of a DevOps team to chase web application firewall policies. So that means that so suddenly the security office needs to define policies and they become part of the pipeline, or the, I say they, they're part of deployment because a DevOps team wants to deploy automatically a, a new version of the portal and then someone needs to get at the same moment the policy is deployed. Eh? So there, is, there was a totally new given for CISO teams. Say, how, do, how do we interact? How do we contribute to security in an automated way? Eh? So that's um, some. Uh, and the other thing is, of course, if you get different DevOps teams beside the same firewall, web application firewall, uh, you don't want them to screw up the policies of the other ones because typically that web application firewall, the permissions might be very coarse grained, instead of fine grained, and meaning like someone who can change policies can do it for any application. So that gives some interesting side effects as well. Was it? Yeah. As I promised, one word on zero trust. I need to keep an eye on the time. Um, zero trust is uh, always verify. Eh? Uh, never trust, always verify. That's the idea. So the old days when we started and firewall was enough is, is long gone. Eh? The, the zero trust is defined in think 2011. The first one who implemented was Google after the famous Aurora attack. Beyond Corp was created. That was the first zero trust based solution. Eh? Um, it took how much? 10 years before we had other zero trust solutions, let's say. But the most common one, and that I use as example, is zero trust network access. Because we all know VPNs. VPNs are very secure. I got my workstation, establish a VPN, I get an encrypted tunnel to my company. So everything is encrypted in transit. I'm good from a security point of view. What's the problem? I might go to the wrong site on my laptop. I've got my VPN up to my company, I've got malware on my laptop, and the malware also likes a VPN tunnel to get to your organization. That's the problem with VPN. So it's an open door, it's like you're at the office, and VPN is like I'm at the office, I can connect somewhere, I get an extension of the internal network on my laptop. So it doesn't protect you against that. You can say like, yes, but I can, of course, limit the, oh, sorry for that, I can limit the type of applications you can go to, I've, this is the VPN uh, concentrator, the gateway at the end. So you can do things, that's true, but we learned the hard way that VPNs are not protecting against malware attacks from the laptop. So how can you do it differently? Zero Trust Network Access, just one example I'm giving here about Zero Trust. So instead of a VPN, I put my policy enforcement point, sorry for that, it's PEP, that uh, policy enforcement point, something that enforces security, I put it outside of my organization. So the enforcement, if I say like, I want to go to this application, the decision is taken here. If you're not allowed, you don't even get in. Eh? Here, the decision is taken here, <laughs> if you're allowed to access. So you're, you're moving, or possibly here, but I can tell you, Corona, I don't want to count the number of companies who set very fast the VPN to have the people remote working, and the VPN is typically set up very broad. 
uh, what's the kind of access they need, the same as on the, on the uh, on-site. So they typically get too much access. Um, so with zero trust network access, what you're doing is like two things. You put the policy enforcement authorization. The second thing is like you establish the connectivity from this proxy outside. There's no longer incoming traffic. It's no longer ingress, it's egress. It's outgoing traffic. For your firewall, there's only outgoing traffic. It doesn't allow traffic in. Suddenly, the whole thing is changed. So this application is no longer exposed, even if it's only through VPN. This is not a public-facing application. It turns the logic at network level. Yeah? So this thing can broker traffic from this device to this application. It becomes a broker. But the fact you change the order of the traffic is totally different given. Yeah? So that's an, a way to do zero trust. Because it's now only people who are, have defined a policy for this application can now access the application. And the certain thing is this firewall doesn't allow anymore any incoming traffic, only outgoing. There are other challenges. How do I maintain this laptop up to date? Because I have, I cannot reach out to it. It's rather, they have solutions for that, but it, it's a totally different given. Okay, some words on building architecture. The, um, I need to take care of time. So the idea of doing architecture is, as I said, you have to build a system context. That's like, I put a black box of my solution. I build a solution, create a black box, which are the actors. I create a logical solution, because logical solution is like, I need an online banking solution, I need a firewall, or that's not even a functional block, but it could be that you think about that. Or, so you need a, like logical capabilities, and then you build the uh, uh, solution itself. And we do call it in our book a deployment architecture diagram because we had to use something that's not from IBM in our book. And we use the C4 model and C4 using deployment architectures. What's, what's in a name? And so you always start like that. You got a system context, you build your components, and then you make your detailed design. So the deployment architecture. The system context is important and very simple. It all sounds very simple. Put your solution, make it a black box, and then say like, all these actors I'm communicating with, human actors, system actors. Do I have connectivity over the internet? Is it only internal? Um, what kind of interactions do you have? And you can say like, and also you see like the use cases. If you have an end user, the employee, you can log on, view a report and things like that. So it's the first analysis that you do, like I got all the requirements and I don't care yet what's inside in my application. I just want to understand like what are all the acts. That's the first thing you do in architecture. Then the next thing is threat modeling. One of the steps you build your logical components and then you see like what can go wrong. Eh? So you say like what are the assets we need to protect? What are the possible threats? What are the type of actors, internal, external actors? And that's what are the mitigating controls. Again, you cannot stop things from happening, but you can define mitigating controls against all the possible threats and depending where the threat actor is. That's how you try it over the different phases of your design, because you can do it now here on a component model. But ideally, once you get your detailed design, you do it also um, when you get the technical design and the data flow, eh? you want to understand like what kind of data is going from which system to which system, and uh, what are all the intermediate connectivities. Eh? So the end-to-end -end security, how do you implement that? You have to know at a certain point you will decide what technology will you choose, which cloud provider, which platform as a service, infrastructure as a service, function as a service, container as a service, I'm forgetting some other abbreviations. Whatever we're using, you make technology choices. And once you get this, make these technology choices, then you start doing like, how I'm gonna deploy this. Eh? Um, this is a diagram from the book where we use an, uh, a case study. We, we create a fictitious company, a fictitious case. But what we try to do is, we try to explain like every step from a security architecture point of view, we first explain what is the architecture doing, and then we say like, okay, put the head on the security architect. For this case study, we explain for each step what are the security things you have to do. Eh? We talk about threat modeling, about um, the uh, uh, zero trust, how you apply zero trust to the solution, and we start building diagrams as a set favorite topic, 
Uh, you can't believe how many hours we spent with the three of us to discuss diagrams, uh, because we're three architects, so that took too much time. <laughs> but anyhow, we had to find a way that we could say, like, this is something that has the same meaning uh, for everyone. And then you start putting the elements, eh? because in a cloud solution, you got a lot of things you get as a service, uh, function or uh, platform, whatever you use. There are things you have to build your own still, eh? because here in this uh, case study, we are developing an application ourselves. Um, I forgot the abbreviations, it's the, uh, it's here, sorry, Clean Air Guilford Cloud uh, solution. So we got a test environment, a development environment test, and then we got a production environment. So we're saying like, okay, we're using all those services, and then we got all the actors, all the things that needs to interact with our solution, and how we add security to that. Eh? Because in reality, this should end up in Terraforms and the Jenkins of the world, because you want like automation again. And there are solutions, um, and I didn't talk about AI yet, eh? I, didn't hear, I didn't say AI, but there are solutions that can, from diagrams you can deploy in the cloud the solution itself. Eh? But that means you need much more of this. Eh? This icon doesn't say to a Terraform, <laughs> how do I build uh, or deploy a solution? So there is of course metadata uh, needed behind the scenes uh, to get this organized. So the, the automation is not only when you start writing code, infrastructure as a code, but the automation you should think about like, if I'm building diagrams, can I use them as um, something that will lead to the deployment of resources? Now, the other way it exists as well, that's the lazy for the architects like me. You can go to a cloud, deploy solution, and build a diagram to tools. Eh? That's, that's easier, more convenient goes faster and it sometimes goes wrong, but okay. There are tools that also build diagrams for you based on existing deployments. That's especially when you have to change something, you're not the one who designed it. You say, okay, what's my starting point? It's never green field. Well, never say never, but typically you start from an existing solution and you have to build something on top of it to change it. And yeah, that's a little about it and I don't, I think I'm doing from time, but I think I've got three minutes left, so that's fine. Uh, this was a bit of a rush, eh? <laughs> but I tried to explain what security architecture is, what a security architecture role is, and like I showed some steps out of the book. Uh, if you got time, you can, uh, it's available on O'Reilly. If you got an O'Reilly account, you can read it already today. But I hope I give a little bit feeling like what's security architecture. Uh, you didn't hear me talking about crypto and different uh, the protocols and algorithms, but that's something, as I said, we as an end user of security solutions, we have to do it what we get. And uh, that's sometimes easy, sometimes hard. Maybe any question? I don't know. I still I don't want to go over time. No questions.